and welcome to the Across the Hall podcast and another very special guest joining us from Asheville, North Carolina, though technically, Steve, are you Fletcher or Fletcher? Yeah, technically yeah. Fletcher, the, the suburbs of the metropolis, <laughs> the, the greater Asheville, North Carolina metropolitan area. Uh, but Steve, we call this a, the Across the Hall podcast because uh, I started it with Mr. Spaker, the English teacher who's across the hall from me. Uh -huh. Well, back in the day, in the 2000s, you were across the hall from me at Mountain Heritage High School. So it kind of comes full circle, right? It does, doesn't it? Wow. So, Thank you for having me. Yes, yeah. great to have you. So Steve Ray, a colleague of mine at Mountain Heritage High School in Burnsville, North Carolina. Notice how I said that. <laughs> uh, which is, oh, about what, 40 minutes northeast of Asheville in the yeah. beautiful mountains of western North Carolina. Yeah, uh, in between Boone and Asheville. Uh, go dead center in between it, and that's Burnsville. And Boone is where, for, for all the Yankees State. that are listening here, uh, where Appalachian State is located. Yeah, not, I did Appalachian. There? not Appalachian. <laughs> I got booed in a class once at Mountain Heritage High School. <laughs> uh, so you just know Mount, once? just once right exactly so oh, yeah. mountain heritage such a great name for the school and i think if i remember right this was the high school that i taught at like there there was a contest right to come up with the name or like a couple women yep. who named it and it's perfect yeah. for it right if you if you look at the campus and if you look at the school it really mm -hmm. is perfect talk a little bit about um what that high school is like and what burnsville is like growing up there steve steve grew yeah. up there yeah, I, I I actually teach in the same classroom that uh, that I had U.S. history in, so um, you know it's full circle for me as well. You know, uh, growing up in a small little town, um, 800 uh, total students at Mountain Heritage on a good year. You know, most of the yeah. time we're around 700 students. Um, small school, um, home body mentality. Uh, a lot of kids. Uh, in the area, uh, typically, uh, or, or back in the 1950s and 60s, was a textile mill town. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of textile mills that were there. Of course, they all disappeared in the 1980s, 90s, of, uh, when NAFTA came through. Uh, all those jobs just kind of disappeared. And so it's, uh, it's now it's become uh, largely tourist-oriented uh, um, uh, service industries. Um, and it's just, it, but it's a, it's a great small town. Um, good kids typically, um, focused, uh, on trying to find a way to kind of move, get out of town, you know? Um, yeah. and a lot of them who are, uh, who are just content to be there as well. And, and like the old mentality of, uh, of the town, because it is very traditional. It's a traditional town, uh, deep Southern town, a lot of Southern Baptists. Um, this is good old Scots Irish territory, right? Oh, for, yeah. our, for our APO students. Yeah. If you can't tell uh, my, my accent, it's probably like this a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever. And of course you get it from the Irish who come into you. You're going to laugh at my, my impersonation. <laughs> Don't, do not make me do the New Jersey accent. Yeah. <laughs> hearing, hearing Mr. Ray try and do uh, a New York or New Jersey accent is a oh, riot. It is not good. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for a second. And just to give people an idea of what we're talking about, um, there's my Asheville footage. I just found some like community footage on YouTube that's like a community mm -hmm. thing. I'm going to set it up. So um, actually, let me go back to my shared screen here. I'm going to try and set it up so there won't be any sound and so we can just have it over that. Uh, stop share. This is like when I do my lessons on Zoom. Uh -huh. I just bump, I bumble around a little bit sometimes. So, wow. all right. So good. This is, I'm going to do optimize for video clip, yet I am going to turn the sound off. So now this is going to be like we're professionals here uh, in the background. You see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's some of the most beautiful land you're going to find in this country. So Otway that's Burns. the town square. Is that yeah. Jebediah Springfield there? Is that who that was? No, no that's Otway Burns. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got a video of me fly fishing. Yeah, right. was, was it you or Norb? <laughs> Uh, if I was catching something, it was me. It's probably Norb. He's beating the yeah. woods down. So. Yeah. Um, Real, uh, you know, sort of some pockets of arts and culture with uh, the CeeLo community. 
and right. you saw the the downtown. Who's this guy, by the way? Do you like? Him? I have no clue who this guy. Okay, is. well, he uh, we're not hearing him right now, but he had good things to say. Of course, he's promoting it. Here are some more images. Um, the mountains are just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mount Mitchell is the tallest peak in the Appalachians. Mm -hmm. And I'm really working hard not to say Appalachians. And that's in Yancey County. And it's not far from where you grew up, right? And where, uh, not far where the golf course is, where you, uh, you played so much golf and, and uh, mm -hmm. you're a tremendous athlete and a great golfer. But um, you know, Mount Mitchell is, is uh, if you're on Mount Mitchell Golf Course, it's visible right above, uh, right out. You're teeing off on hole number one. It's directly above it. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. If uh, I'm hope I'm doing a good job, good enough job promoting uh, Burnsville to where people definitely. can visit. This is it's a fun little town. Too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, I'm in year number fourteen teaching. I've mm -hmm. been kind of a vagabond because you know nobody wants to wants to keep me around. Um, <laughs> But I, I taught one year in, the, in my college town where I went to college in Lexington, Virginia at Rockridge County High School. But then I went to Mountain Heritage for three years. Mm -hmm. It would have been from 2005 to 2008. Right. And uh, Steve, you were on the faculty. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. We barely, we barely talked for the first year because you had some, some stuff going on in your personal life. Uh -huh. uh, I was like, who's this guy? He doesn't even talk to me. And then as it turned out, uh, we wound up uh, really forming a, a lifelong friendship. I think of yeah. you as my my older brother from another mother. Uh, well, I, I do the same with you. Uh, yeah, and and you know that it it was a great and it still is a great environment. I'm still there. We miss you terribly. We wish you'd come back and hope that <laughs> you will. But uh, but it, it, you know you form. No, you're the last one. I was looking today. You're the only one. I know. Um, that's, that's still, still there, there in the social studies department. That is correct. I'm the last one of, uh, of the group that was there when you were there. Yep. Um, and I've got 24 years in. So, and I, wow. I'm thinking about retiring here in the next few years. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm, uh, you know, uh, best suited to be doing distance learning <laughs> as you, you know, uh, I, I struggle with technology and, and the whole. It only took us 40 minutes to get set up here <laughs> with, the, with the Zoom meeting. Yeah, this was uh, typical me. Uh, in your defense, though, I think something wonky was going on. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for that. I'll, I'll take that. But uh, How do you yeah. like, by the way, how do you like the, the, the makeshift studio behind me here? Oh, I like that a lot. Hey, uh, it, Macy, you put her to work, it looks like. Yeah, like. Macy made the sign. I got the John Green thing going with the globe. Uh-huh, I uh, like um, it. And then I got my bobbleheads up top there. Yeah, I see that. I, I, I like the TR one. I like that TR, a lot. TR, yeah. Know, man. I got I RBG that. back there. It's not a bobblehead. It's like a doll, but yeah, I Hamilton see her over and there. Lincoln. And, um, by the way, I've been watching – the Roosevelt's. I talked about this with Jason Panetti last week. Have uh -huh. you ever watched the Ken Burns Roosevelt's? I have not. It's I, amazing. I, I haven't yeah. seen it yet. I, I, I want to see it. So you're, you're the second one actually this week who has encouraged me to, to watch it. So. And when you finally get your, uh, your sorry butt up here, uh, we're going to go to, uh, I want to take you to Hyde Park and to uh, Sagamore Hill on Long Island where Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, I'm going to hold you to it. I uh, am. And we'll go to a Mets game and a Yankees game. And it's nice uh, to just think about the days where we can do that, right? It is. I long for those days. Of course, oh. Boston's going to be uh, playing, I hope, uh, at least one of those games. We're going to have to to get that happening. But that's how do you turn, a, that's, how do you turn into a Red Sox fan? Uh, just to spite you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's there and it stays yeah. on my head constantly. Yeah, Actually, it's probably more Robert Buckner. Um, Robert oh, that's Buckner, right. He, he was more of the cantankerous Yankee fan, not the Mets fan. Like, yeah. Uh, so you I just can take to, the Mets, just not the Yankees. So. You're just trying to tick off Buckner, yeah. So yeah. give us some perspective. So you talked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about where you are. Um, pretty rural area of course i'm at a in a rural school district as well and i laugh when you say we're small because mm -hmm. one of the differences between southern public schools and northern public schools is here in new york we tend to have every little town has its own school district and so uh -huh. you know our school we're talking two to three hundred students total in the high school 60 70 kids in a graduating class right wow. but for north carolina um 
mostly done at the county level. So you're in Burnsville, but right. you have the entire county goes to one school, right? And I don't yeah. think people realize how far do some people travel because the because of the mountains in mm -hmm. Yancey County uh, in terms of bus rides and whatnot. Some students are on the bus for an hour and forty five minutes. Wow. Um, when I was, uh, whenever I was in school, it, I, I, the bus ride to my house was an hour and 15 minutes up on South Toe, and that wasn't the, the furthest part. Uh, we still had students who rode uh, another 45 minutes. Um, so, I mean, you have people who are driving a bus who are, are basically taking almost three to four hours to do their, their bus routes. And it's morning great. and afternoon, it's almost like yeah. it's a complete full-time job then, huh? It, it, it is. Uh, I mean, it's, it's better now. We have better roads than we did then, but it, you're, you're still talking about, you know, an hour, hour and 30 minutes just because of the distances. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge, and particularly in the wintertime, whenever we get any kind of snow, and I know you laugh at this, <laughs> it, you know as well as I do. I mean, it even calls for snow here. Yeah. But boom, but they shut it down because of the the dangerous roads. First week I was, or first year I was teaching at Mountain Heritage, there was one day where I didn't even think about the weather, and also realized that it's at a higher elevation than Asheville where I lived, and so you know a lot of times it won't snow at all in Asheville, but if you go up into into the mountains northeast of Asheville, it does. Right. So, and even when I came up the the hill. So I got this isn't bad, and I had no idea that school was canceled. <laughs> I know, but that dusting that happens there, and then at yeah. 50, 5,200 feet, then, you know, that's a pretty good snow, and, and you're talking yeah. dangerous conditions. So they had to shut it. They shut stuff down. I'm the same way. I live in Asheville. I commute to Burnsville, which is an hour commute. And, yep. uh, you know, there are days I get up, and I'm, I'm like heading out the door, and then I'll get the call. Uh, school's been canceled. Uh, on average, how many days do you think, if I remember, it was usually like at least 10, right? It was 11, uh, the, the, the overall average for Yancey County over the past 10 years is 11, uh, 11 and a half, wow. 11 and a half days per year uh, that we missed due to snow. So uh, we, we factor that into our scheduling. Uh, we, we go uh, one, one week earlier and we stay one uh, week later than most school systems uh, for that very reason. Stephen Ray, my former across the hall colleague joining us on the pod this week. What has it been like for you guys in terms of the whole COVID-19 experience uh, as a school and then just Western North Carolina in general? Well, it, you know, this area has not been uh, hit hard by COVID-19. Um, Yancey County was uh, one of the last, one of the last two counties to have any COVID cases. Um, but nonetheless, we've been shut down since March the 13th uh, as a preventive measure. Um, and so we've had the quarantine, the, the, the stay in place uh, mentality here. Um, yeah. And because I live in, uh, in Buncombe County, uh, much more so here. Uh, back in Yancey County, there's there's a little bit more of a mentality that they shouldn't be shut down. Uh, yeah. Should be following the the same procedures. You know, generally across the the board, a lot of people are very frustrated with the fact that that everything is shut down in Yancey County, um, and that's what I'm getting from a lot of those people are are that they feel like it could have been handled a little differently in rural America as to yeah. in, in, in some of the cities. And, and that's, you know, I, I have different opinions of that as well because of the mobility factor, you know, how many Me, people in from, Yancey County are commuting into Asheville, right? I mean, they're, they're quiet. Every, every <laughs> person who has any kind of a profession or professional job, they're commuting. In the mornings, whenever I'm driving into Burnsville, I'm passing 15 to one cars coming the opposite direction, coming from Burnsville into Asheville. That's like me going from Rochester to uh, Manchester Shortsville. It's kind of the same thing. You're going against yeah. traffic. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and a lot of, I don't, I don't think a lot of individuals and particularly your old school, uh, you know, the old school people who are, are like that were such a rural area that it couldn't get here. They don't really realize the, the, the mobility factor um, that is playing into this. Uh, and, and 
And that's what I've tried to stress to my students is that, uh, you know, with mobility and great mobility and access to it comes the, um, in a pandemic, uh, the, the, the threat of spreading so quickly in such a small amount of time. So, um, well, Steve, yeah. you teach U S history and AP U S history, just like I do. And we're going to talk about that more a little bit later for my APUS students, mm -hmm. but Certainly, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about the parallels to the to the flu pandemic of 1918. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, the, the, the correlations are, are eerie in, in a lot of respects in terms of um, and, and what I've tried to emphasize to my kids is, is that that mobility at that particular time was so different and so less than what we have now that it, it's it's quite amazing that this hasn't spread yeah further and quicker in my in my opinion but what was interesting with 1918 is that compared to earlier eras they had kind of entered a new stage mm -hmm. because uh well you had the world i mean world war one played a huge role because 1918 is your year where world war one is winding down right so you have soldiers from all these different countries going back to their home countries and wow. then the other thing i was reading about is this idea that you know when you have a virus the fr from a from a spreading standpoint, if you look at things from the virus's standpoint in terms of wanting to spread into other people and other hosts, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to kill your victim too quickly because then they can't spread it. Exactly. But with like all the ambulances in World War I, they would be pulling these guys off the front line, sending them back to the, to the hospitals. And that yeah. was a big way that it spread too because yeah. people were making these people who would otherwise be so sick that they wouldn't be able to spread the virus now mm -hmm. they are making them ambulatory and then spreading it. Yeah, and, and, and what I've really tried to talk about with the kids is, is how this, uh, and, and how these different types of viruses change and they mutate over time and over a short period of time and how they become, you know, just so resilient. And then what we're seeing now is the manifestation of, of, of a long period of uh, of evolution of a particular virus from yeah. the SARS from from what it was and, uh, and and that's the scary part about this particular uh, strand in my opinion in, in how uh, contagious it really is and that's that, that's so scary um, and I don't know if you've seen but uh, um, uh, the uh, medical consultant for uh, the NBC broadcast who uh, um, he just came down with yeah. uh, COVID-19 and he is a professional yeah. who goes into these areas and he's the guy who yeah would go into Africa with Ebola yeah. right yeah yeah it, it, and so if, if he can catch it as preventative as he measures as he's he's taken um, it's quite scary the the fact of how this is so mobile and now, one of the, the differences between 1918 and this pandemic, or so we thought, was that it really didn't seem to be affecting younger people as much, where for whatever reason, the 1918 pandemic did. Now, of course, you know, there's lots of other things you have to think about, like the fact that we were pre-antibiotics -antibio in 1918. There's still yeah. a lot of people that didn't really understand germ theory uh, and how disease spread. Mm -hmm. But it's been scary to see some of these stories coming out about this syndrome in children. Right. Um, yeah. Seems to be attacking other organs and then doing so after the initial respiratory infection. Yeah, that that's scary stuff. And again, I, I don't know whether it's the mutation part or just the evolution part of this that we're seeing. Uh, it, to, to me, um, what you guys are seeing in New York and particularly New York city proper yeah. and in that area is uh eventually going to filter its way out into rural america and um that that part is the scary part to me is how this is going to play out over the period of the next year and a half if, and and if we do not see a vaccine um you know how how long does this play out yeah I mean, does it play out over the course of a year to two years? And by that particular point, how, how is it mutated? I mean, you know, this is, uh, how far are we into this uh, legitimately? Five months, maybe four to five months 
and we're always already starting to see the mutations that are uh, that are happening with this. Uh, um, you know, if we're here a year and a half and we're still talking about this, that's to me is going to be the scary part and how it continues to mutate. For sure. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about some more fun <laughs> yeah. topics. All right, but that, that was a good, great discussion there on, on COVID and we could keep going. Oh, yeah. um, so when I, when I went to teach in, in, at Mountain Heritage High School, obviously you guys don't, you don't get a bunch of Yankees coming in there to teach very much, do you? Not a whole lot. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the one. The one and only. <laughs> um, a, couple, a couple stories. Do you remember the prank that, um, that the Moose Club pulled? So there was a group of teachers at Mountain Heritage called the Moose Club uh, that, that Steve was a part of. And do you guys remember the, the, the prank that Norb orchestrated on me uh, Yeah, with my classroom? Oh, uh, I, uh, that one, I'm not sure that I recall that one. You may, what so, so my third year, I finally got my own room because I was on a cart the first two years. All right. And there was a letter in my, in my mailbox one day about how they were going to take my room away. It was from the <laughs> superintendent. <laughs> And I go into the principal's office fired up. I know nobody can imagine this of me being all fired up. I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, I can't remember what the reason was they were taking my room, but it was some, it was, <laughs> it was one thing. If I was paying attention, I would have realized it was fake because of some of like, the, there was like a seal at the bottom and stuff, but it was actually really good of faking the letter. Um, but so the principal and I call the superintendent and then all of a sudden the principal starts laughing and, and realizes that because the superintendent's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not taking Mr. Harrington's classroom away from him. <laughs> that is, uh, that's about par for the course. Uh, the, the, the Boost Club, uh, everybody, the initiation was you had to get pranked and you had to prank someone else. So yeah, uh, they took my classroom, uh, my, the prank that got me initiated into it. Um, they called me to the office and then they took my classroom and all of my classroom was gone. I couldn't <laughs> find them. I come back and they're gone. <laughs> and this is, and I couldn't find them for the hour. I, I, I went around on a search trying to find my kids and they had taken them to the football field and down below the football field. <laughs> and, and boom. Go I, hard or go home, man. If you're going to do it, know. do it right. Right. It took my class. So I'm how like, many people, they did that fast. How many people do you think were involved in that operation? <laughs> oh, uh, well, if you remember Barry Johnson, uh, oh yeah, DJ, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the head basketball coach, and um, and the vice principal and the principal were both involved in that. Outstanding. Uh, you know, and, and, and that that just speaks to kind of a lighter time, though, in, in how yeah. you looked at things. Uh, you know, uh, in the modern era, you know, time on task has become such a such a, a driving factor in education that a lot of times the fun part of it's kind of uh, fallen by the wayside. But yeah, uh, uh, I but talked a little bit last week with Jason Benetti about accents, and we've we've talked about uh, I got booed for saying Appalachians instead of Appalachians. <laughs> I remember Jack Tipton one time was trying to tell me I need some eyes. I'm like, you got eyes? They're right here. No, ass. You guys add extra syllables to stuff, man. It gets really confusing. And then my favorite is the kid who, or there was a kid missing, and I asked where he was, and people were saying he was laying out, and I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> yeah, he's laying out. He's he laying out. <laughs> Never heard of that before. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure there's a ton of uh, northern expressions that we're unfamiliar with, too. But uh, laying out ice, I think that does <laughs> uh, You adapted pretty well. You, you, you I got started, there. Yeah, you got there eventually. But yeah. uh, that's funny, man. Those are funny times. Yancey County, I used to joke. So you would go up a big hill. Um, there is no, there is literally like no four lane highway that runs through Yancey County. There's no interstate. Um, you know, there's a couple spots where like you go up a big mountain, they give you an extra lane so you can pass the trucks. Right. That's yeah. like the, that's, that's as big as the roads get. And I, I used to joke that when I would drive up the hill in the Western part of the County there into Yancey County, it was like stepping into doc Brown's DeLorean and going <laughs> back about 30 years. Uh, well, you'll be happy to know that since you left, 
There is now a four lane road all the way through Yancey County. Congratulations. We just, it, well, it's not complete yet. They had just started it when I left, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that tells you about our, uh, our DOT here. Uh, you know, uh, time is not of the essence, that's for sure. I also remember that I would stop at a gas station that had the old dial pumps and quickly realized that most of the gas stations in Yancey County had the old dial pumps. <laughs> they also would like combine different types of uh, facilities like you know, it'd be like park, gas station, convenience store, gun shop, and pool hall, all rolled into one. <laughs> <laughs> convenience store. <Yeah. laughs> the convenience shoot some pool store. and Everything. buy something to shoot. You could, uh, you could find your future wife there and <laughs> parts. <laughs> it was an experience. Um, you're, you grew up in, in Yancey County. Um, and now you live in Asheville with, with uh, your, your wife, The Dish. But you went to high school at Mountain Heritage, and you had quite the athletic career. Uh, you were outstanding football player, basketball player, and you were there at the same time that Brad Johnson, a name that some of our uh, sports fans that are watching may recognize, the, the mm -hmm. quarterback who would go on to play for the Vikings and some other teams. And you guys yeah. had some epic battles, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brad, um, I don't know if you recall Sam Gash, who played for New England. He was yes. in our conference as well. Hendersonville, right? Yeah, his brother Eric was on the same team. He played yeah. at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. There were some very good athletes in this area at that particular time. Brad Johnson and I um, used to play um, uh, on the same AAU team, and uh, we went to the national championships in our, our junior year and came in fourth but uh um we had some really good athletes and brad was a great basketball player as well he uh at florida state he played it he played basketball as well as football uh eventually he, he decided to go football which was probably the smart route for him of course yeah, I think he ended he, up I think with a super well, bowl yeah. ring, right he's he done, he done all right <laughs> yeah yeah he did well he, he went to well. owen right he did, yeah. We beat uh, we beat them um, on a last second shot. Uh, my my senior year. Every time that I see Brad, these I'll see him. Hey, you remember that shot you hit? God, <laughs> that tore my heart out. You ripped my heart out. I've heard I've heard the stories. Yeah, yeah. That's a legend. How far was you hit? Like a half court shot, right? Yeah, it was. It was one step past half court. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, and to this day, he will not let me uh, – anytime we meet, of course, he's like – he brings that shot up, of course. Wow. But uh, we had some, some great athletes uh, in this area at that particular time. He went on and uh, had stellar careers. Everywhere. Of course, Owen, Owen High School is in Black Mountain, North Carolina, which is just east of Asheville and mm -hmm. probably best known for the home of Roy Williams – Mm -hmm. who has gone on, obviously, to have quite the career as the coach at Kansas and, and now at, uh, at Chapel Hill. And Roy has always been very good about, um, you know, staying in touch with, with Black Mountain in the Asheville area. Yeah, during this, uh, the shutdown, I've seen him quite frequently. He has a, uh, a Carolina Blue uh, convertible that he rides around in. No uh, way, really? And, yeah, and uh, he, he plays golf over at the same golf course that I do quite often. I see him great. on Saturdays. And, and just okay. wave at him. And, and uh, I think I've told you the story that the first person outside of Amy and I to find out that uh, we had just been matched up with our now daughter, Macy, mm -hmm. uh, who at the time was a little six month old girl named Tadala, uh, was Roy Williams. Because when I got the call from my wife and she had gotten the call from the adoption agency, I uh -huh. was waiting outside Roy Williams' office to interview him before. UNC Asheville played North Carolina when I was doing play-by-play -play for UNC Asheville. So, oh, man, that's um, awesome. And then I went in and, and I told him, I said, you know, he's like, how are you doing? And uh, he's super nice guys. Like, hi, Brendan. Good to see you again. Cause I had, uh, interviewed him a couple of times mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm doing pretty well. I just found out I'm, I'm getting a little girl and told him about it. So I always uh -huh. point that out to Macy when we see Roy on television. So. <laughs> that's an awesome story. Isn't there. it great? Isn't it yeah. Great? Um, so you got some scholarship offers and ultimately mm -hmm. wound up most, most of your scholarship offers were for football, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more for football. I was uh, a free safety. Um, I was a quarterback, but more, uh, you know, I was defensive oriented. Uh, 
And in football, I was I was much better football player than I was a basketball player. Um, so Naval Academy, um, you know, Pepperdine. That's odd. I know on the West Coast, but uh, then you could have uh, been in Malibu. Yeah, no. I look back on it, and I'm like, wow, what was I what thinking? Were you thinking? Exactly. No, I ended up I ended up at Wake Forest, though. That was a good fit for me, though. That was a good school. And even though you were you were offered a scholarship and, and received a scholarship to play football at Wake Forest. How mm -hmm. did you wind up being a, a basketball player? You, you played four, four letters, right? At, uh, for the basketball team. Well, yeah, uh, it's an odd story. I was being recruited by them. Um, I was never offered a scholarship, um, but I, I, I'd already expressed my interest and I told them that I was going to come there anyway, because I'd, I wanted to go to law school and uh, Wake Forest Law Schools, it, it was a good um, school for if you wanted to practice in North Carolina. Yeah, it was yeah. the best school. It's a great school. Yeah, I looked at okay. it. I almost went there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great school. And so they already knew that I wanted to go there and I wanted to play football. But when I got there, um, a, a player by the name of Muggsy Bogues had just left. And so there's there, a name drop. Yeah. The, their their first line recruit uh, point guard um, he got another offer and so at the last minute they were left without a point guard and um, I was on the football team and had just started practicing and they offered me the opportunity to come over to basketball um, and uh, they said that they would give me money down the road if I uh, uh, you know if I would do that uh, yeah. And so, so, okay, so you didn't initially have a scholarship for football, but then wound up getting it for basketball. Uh, here's, here's the interesting thing. I actually had an academic scholarship to go there. So football really didn't even have to offer wow. me the scholarship yeah. because I'd already expressed my interest on going, in going there. So yeah. I, I ended up, I was going to play football and then I ended up on the basketball team. Got, uh, you know, I got decent play in time my freshman year. Um, I'll never forget the first game uh, that was televised. Um, I hit a three pointer and um, this was pre cell phone era. I get back to the dorm and my um, answering machine has blown up, literally has <laughs> blown up. <laughs> Because my students are saying, what's an answering machine? Yeah, I, I know. Well, this answering machine, the tape had had literally been filled up with yeah. individuals. Said, I saw you on TV, Stevie Ray. <laughs> <laughs> it was every every redneck friend of mine <laughs> in the world was calling up. And I, I was pretty pumped, too. It was an exciting time. Well, I'm going to share my screen here because... I uh, I would like to share the lifetime statistics of Steve Ray <laughs> off of sportsreference.com. 87-88 season, he played 23 games, shot 50% from the field. <laughs> look at the, the uh, look at that three point Four for percent. five from three. You are a career fifty percent three point shooter. Eight of sixteen. That's I, I, I tell you, man. It, I, it, had I not, you see that statistic in the in the uh, yeah my junior year, I blew my knee out in that first game of this season. Five minutes. You played five minutes, and you've I told me before you were primed for a good year, right? Oh yeah, I was. I was. I was setting up to get to get some serious playing time that year. <sighs> And the first uh, first uh, game of the year, stole the basketball, uh, was going out of bounds and stepped, and I blew my knee out. The, the, the whole thing just collapsed on me. ACL tear, meniscus, it was a catastrophic injury. Um, and I never really came back from that. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was one of those devastating injuries that just, they, they ruin think, a career. Do you think if that happens 20 years later, so that would have been what, 1990? 89. It was 89. Yeah, yeah November yeah. of 89. November of 89, 89, 90 season. You think that happens 10, 15, 20 years later? With the uh, <sighs> medical know, advances huh? that there there are now and, and how, you know, the, the scar that was left for me uh, and how they went in and did it was, uh, uh, you know, pretty pretty major. Um, and today, uh, how they go in and, and they do it is, is less invasive and um, – not near as uh, as catastrophic as it was. So, 
you know, you see people come back from those types of injuries better today. And uh, our physical therapy uh, ideologies are much more advanced. Um, because I remember I was off of my f leg for about two, three weeks. And today, you know, in the modern era, you're back yeah. on it almost immediately. Um, how you condition to get back is very, very different. Um, so my, my, my feeling would be that had I had that kind of injury, I would have been back much sooner and, and been in a better position um, to kind of continue the career, my career. But, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. Um, that was, uh, that just told me I, I definitely was not going to be NBA caliber. <laughs> the John Stockton of my era was definitely not going to happen. So what I tell people about you, what, what's your, what was your official height and uh, weight? listing does that have that on the uh... oh, i'm pretty sure it does i was i was six feet even and about a buck 60. six foot a buck 60. maybe, maybe a buck 60. yeah uh, that's, they don't have that on here or at least i'm not looking in the right place but so what i tell people is you know that that boy must have been able to shoot <laughs> so the 50 <laughs> percent yeah, like I six mean, foot white, 160 and white, you better <laughs> have been able to shoot <laughs> well my coat i i, I was uh Recruited by Bob Stack, and then uh, Coach Odom came in my junior year. Dave Odom, and, yep. Yeah, he gave me a, he gave me the full scholarship and 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 let me have the academic scholarship so I could utilize that in law school. But long story short, he he was always on to me about you've just got to shoot more because yeah. I I just never really looked to shoot. I'm, I was a point guard mentality of distributing the ball, and he's he's like you've got to shoot more. And I, that just wasn't in my nature. I was more of the, uh, you know, just um, making sure that the offense was getting into the rhythm and, and things like that. Uh, I was more of the general on the floor than uh, than a scoring machine. <laughs> yeah. Was uh, looking back, was there a moment like your freshman year? Because you, you played, you know, significant minutes your freshman year, had some success. You told the story. Was there a moment like you were like, oh, my God, like look at these athletes and look at these guys I'm playing with? I mean, obviously, you you know, you and Brad are, are and Sam Gash, you mentioned, are going to dominate, you know, Western North Carolina high school athletics. But Oh, yeah. Um, we, had a, we had a guy on our team. His name was Robert Seiler. And uh, Robert had a 42-inch vertical. And uh, I'm playing, I, I, I'm playing, uh, this is a pickup game right as I, as a freshman. And um, I'm going down the left-hand side of the lane and Robert is coming on the right-hand side and I throw an alley-oop and I legitimately throw this thing out of the gym. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. And he goes up and he grabs it with his right hand and his left hand, he grabs the rim and he pulls it over and tomahawks it. At that particular moment, I realized this is a different kind of ball than I have ever been exposed to. It, it this was, isn't the Western Highlands Conference anymore. Is that what it was called? It, it was, <laughs> yeah, at that time, Western, yeah. If you, if you got one dunk a game and some little skinny white kid rattled it home, the place <laughs> went crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So this was, this was uh, head and shoulders above, and, and the talent was just phenomenal. Was Rodney Rogers was a freshman when you were a senior? Is that what it was? Uh, or when I was a junior. Junior, okay. Uh, yeah, that junior year, we really picked it up. We made it into the NCAA. Um, we did that my junior and senior year. We were we were we did well. That's when Randolph Childress came in with Rodney. Um, the year after I left, of course, we won the ACC. That, was that um, the year Childress blew up? Yes, at the ACC was, tournament. That was the year that that yeah. Randolph really blew up. Yeah, he and now uh, his kid is 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 he? Did he finish at Wake Forest already? He Brandon Childress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. Yeah, and, and 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 Randolph is there. He was the interim head coach for a while until yeah. they found this uh, this new guy from ETSU. So, yeah, Wake has been struggling to get the the program kind of back to where it was with yeah. Tim Duncan and that those teams in the late nineties. It's hard. Uh, it's really hard for uh, for Wake and those kinds of schools to recruit the way that uh, you know that Roy is able to and, and, and Krzyzewski is as well. You know, those guys get the cream of the crop every yeah, year. Yeah, for much. sure. Have you? Um, you and I haven't talked at all about this. Have you been watching the Jordan doc? I the last not, dance. I'm, I'm not watching it because I want to watch it all consecutively. You're going to binge it. 
I'm going to binge it. I want to binge watch it's awesome. it all the way through. I know it's, I've, I've been telling people I don't want to know. I don't want to hear it. Okay. I have a, I have a story about uh, uh, Michael Jordan, uh, if you want to hear it. All right, it. let's hear it, yeah. Um, so I was, uh, as a basketball player, you couldn't do your own college's uh, uh, basketball and the ACC at that particular time. You couldn't do their, their uh, team camps. And so you had to go to other, other schools to do it. So I was at Chapel Hill. And this is when Jordan had won. He just, this is 90, this is 90, 91, I guess. And Jordan was with the Bulls. And he, had came, he came back to uh, um, the, uh, the camp there. And every night you had your uh, the camp counselors, which I was one. They all, we would all get together and we'd play. And Jordan was playing that night. And, and of, of course, I'm guarding someone else, but there's a screen, and I come off on Michael Jordan here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm face up with Michael Jordan, and Michael Jordan, he, you know, could pop yeah. in the basketball, and he holds it up over his head like this, and I'm up in his – I'm right up in, inside of him. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, man, come on, come on. And he looks down at me, and I'll never forget this. He laughs. He just he giggles. And then he just tosses the ball over there and he shakes his head like. <laughs> Who the hell is that guy? <laughs> I know. And I'm so glad he didn't embarrass me because yeah. he did have a heartbeat. And I know, know that's what he was, uh, he was well, doing. We'll have, to, we'll have to talk after the doc because uh, – after you watch the doc because uh, there's like three different stories I want to go to after you told me that. But uh, yeah. I'll just say – a lot of the the stories you hear about how competitive he was, it, it really comes out in the documentary. So yeah, yeah, I um, that. Yeah. one more thing, and then we're going to shift to uh, AP mode. And so for those people who are just here for the, for the general pod uh, can, can sign out after that. But for whatever reason, I always remember the story you told me about a teammate and a flight you had one time, a rough flight. <laughs> Um, you know, the thing about flying into Asheville's airport is because of the mountains, it could get pretty dicey. And I had a few, yeah, few flights where the bags came out and I'm not talking about people's gym bags. Um, <laughs> yeah. remind me of that story. Cause it just, the way you tell it is awesome. Oh, we were, we were playing Marquette university <laughs> and we were in, uh, we were in Chicago and, um, it was, uh, it was wintertime. It was January and we were supposed to go down to Marquette. Uh, real, I mean, not a long distance at all, uh, but because of snow, they were going to fly us in a private jet down there, uh, well, a prop plane, and so, and I found it fairly peculiar that because it was snowing so bad that they wanted to fly us there, but long story short, we get into this plane, and it's just big enough for the, the, the team plus our, uh, you know, our support personnel and um, this, this plane takes off and the pilot immediately comes on and he says, guys, this is going to be a rocky flight. We're not going to get too high, which means that we're going to be in all kinds of turbulence. So, so just get prepared for it. And sure enough, about two minutes after he says that we start just dropping and, and we're dropping a hundred feet or so Ugh, and just bottoming that. out. And, and I mean, things are terrible and, and white uh, knuckle in the seat. <laughs> oh, that, that's it. And uh, we, we had the one particular character on our team who later becomes a, a, a preacher here in the South. He, he, uh, he starts praying out loud and it is, it was one of the most, funny prayers that I have ever heard is that he went through every sin that he had ever committed. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, if I ever get off this plane, I promise I will not, <laughs> I will not drink anymore. I will not curse anymore. I will not. He went through them and there's people throwing up and it, it was the day of the game. It wasn't like yeah. we were the night before we went, got off the plane and we went straight into the game. Uh, by the way, I had my career high there. Thank you very much. 11 outstanding because everybody else was sick yeah right <laughs> yeah but when he landed was he like when he landed thank you jesus <laughs> yeah. he got down and he kissed the ground on there oh man and he's kissing the ground and oh everybody was everybody was laughing but we were also just oh that was just horrible flight. well i would argue one of the top 10 movie scenes of all time is the almost famous 
Yes. Like, that's going down and everybody starts confessing on the way down. <laughs> that's that's, the, yeah, that's, that's kind of what was happening with him. Todd, yeah, uh, something out. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Steve, thanks so much. Um, say hi to everybody up there, all the former Mountain Heritage peeps, Jack Tipton and Jim Rose and John Harden, that whole crew. That's yeah, certainly. Um, that's this certain. was fun. This was fun. Yeah. Thank All right. We're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to end part one here. Uh, and we're going to come back here for my AP students in just a minute. Thanks again, Mr. Ray. Tell me, tell me, tell me.